my name is Kara Larkham, and I am the STEM Curriculum Coordinator for North Inner Public Schools. We're here tonight at the fourth annual STEM exhibition um, of the eighth grade class at North Inner Middle School. This is the first year that we're holding it at the high school, and it's been a great opportunity for students to come and see the high school. And our AP science students are the ones who judge the finalists and did a fantastic job this afternoon and everybody now is here for a community event to take a look at all the projects and in a little while we'll be announcing the winners in each of the categories as well as an overall winner. Um, this year students have really turned it up a notch, they've expanded their research starting off at the library and picking some really fantastic projects to explore over about a three month span uh, culminating in tonight's exhibition. Some of the projects have been absolutely amazing and one that struck me as one I could relate to was the difference between coffee and water and what kept you up at night and I thought that was interesting and then we have some amazing ones with um, what when you get hacked and what gets you hacked with your technology and I also found that very interesting and a little scary but anyway it's been a phenomenal event and we look forward to doing it next year too. I'm Mr. Jordan. I have the pleasure of giving out this year's biology award. Uh, in case you weren't aware, we separated our finalists into different disciplines of science. And so the first one up will be our biology sector. Uh, we had a big turnout. You guys probably saw the finalists up here for biology. But I'm not going to go on and on. I'm just going to go ahead and read the name. All right, the winner of the. 2017 Science Fair is La La Land. <laughs> Actually, no, no, no. This year's actual award goes to a project with the title, It's All in Your Head, this is Kate Lovett. Um, I tested a helmet's ability to prevent skull, uh, to prevent concussions. Um, my question was how many, how much G-forces uh, do helmets absorb during an impact um, to help reduce potential concussion and my hypothesis was that if a person sustained an impact while wearing a helmet then the, um, then the helmet would absorb very little of the G-forces. I used these shock indicators and I put them on the head and the helmet and after each impact test I ran I would compare what sensors went off on the helmet and what went off on the what sensors went off on the head. I concluded that the helm the helmets didn't provide any protection from concussions. Help the kids do these projects. We certainly appreciate it. We understand the hard work and support that you have put behind them. Without further ado, I need to announce the chemistry award. The name of the project is Oil Spill. Isabel Dury and Pernalia So our project is on oil spills and what we did is we wanted to clean up these oil spills so we created a herder in which the oil is going to be, if you spread it on the edges of an oil slick, the herder condenses into one smaller slick and you can set it on fire so all the oil is gone. So our herder is made out of um, sodium lauryl sulfate, sodium lauryl sulfate and lauryl minoxide which we got from uh, the, uh, that which we researched and we used those three chemicals to really help with the her herding process. All right, so guys, our award in the Earth and Environmental Science, well, that tied in anyone that's working with green technology, that tied in any project that's actually working on Earth Science itself. You would have seen those projects right around this area. Uh, so, this year's winners 
are three gentlemen that worked on geothermal heating and cooling systems. This is Seth DeSalvo, Peter Martel, and Will So, our project was a geothermal heating and cooling system, and basically how it works is you have a water circulator there, which circulates water, and there are tubes here, and basically this is not like a real one, this is just a, um, a simulation, but on a real geothermal heating and cooling pump, uh, the tubes go 10 feet down and it's usually 60 to 70 degrees so the water heats up and then right here we have a fan that will blow up the hot air and they'll come out so in our simulation we have the water circulator which a real geothermal heat pump would have and it runs through our yard that's filled with dirt and comes to our our simulated heat pump we have over here we have a heating a heating element to make the heat actually like work and when you plug everything in the water will circulate heat will start to form in the heating element and our fan that we have will blow it up through the vents and this is kind of our the vent that would throw that would blow your fan, uh, air through your house I just want to give a quick shout out and hopefully you guys can show your appreciation uh, this next teacher uh, this is his last year at NAMS. He's retiring and he spent a long time there. This is uh, the Honorable Mr. Barry Connell. I know that sounds odd coming from a biologist. That's why I'm giving up the science, physics, and engineering prize. Uh, physics and engineering is a growing field, becoming more and more important for the passing year. And so I'm very pleased to make this award to Nick Lucarini and Eli Brown. because in the 21st century, people are getting hacked like crazy. And it's actually one of the top issues facing people today. So what we did was we tested the myth that making your password longer, adding capital letters and numbers, actually makes it odd. Uh, harder to crack, if you will. And um, Nick's going to talk about that. Yes. So what we tested was we took a PDF and we locked it with just a simple... What? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so a PDF is a file called a portable document file. It's like a doc file if you're using uh, Microsoft Word. It's a, a very common file and uh, people uh, very often actually block it getting a faint sense of security. Yes, yeah, so we used just a simple program that we found on the internet. No Okay. And um, just using that, we locked the PDF with a password and we recorded how long it took to crack. So each one we got the words per second, how many words it took to guess the password, and how long it took to guess the password. It also says the pass what the password is. And we tested it about 36 or more times on different passwords using numbers, lowercase letters, and numbers <coughs> and lowercase letters. And each one the most probably is a five digit nine, straight nines, and that took about 19 hours. It could take 19 hours. We didn't want it all the way. <laughs> 
So you might be asking yourself why you join us here, because this is a hacking project. Well, I'm a big aviator, and uh, this is my friend, Eric. And I was doing some research when I was doing this and I was doing some research on how it could be hacked. And it turns out that during the startup sequence of this drone, um, it, it puts out its own personal Wi-Fi code. And anybody, I have the fancy controller, but anybody that just has a free app could override the drone security features and hack it. And uh, if you hold on one second, uh, I gotta get this going. I need to disconnect myself, but I'm sorry. Yeah, so what he was trying to say was, wow, this drone is in its startup sequence, but it's trying to connect to whatever it's using. So in that time, somebody can connect to it using just their phone, if they have the free app, from over a mile away. And then hit the return the hold sequence, and it will automatically start, go up to about 400 feet, and fly back to you and land like right at your feet. And so uh, it's an easy way just to, to demonstrate, we're going to take off and hold the mic. I'm going to take off the aircraft right now. Uh, I'm just going to set it on the ground, raise it up to a height of three feet, carefully. My dad was a science te teacher and he visited in Linfield for 35 years, so I'm so happy it's in North Andover to work with my colleagues and Carol the Foam on this. Uh, without further ado, and I'm very excited for this announcement, thank you my glasses. The overall winner in biology this year, the effects of UV light on bacteria, Nicole Fisher, everyone to So um, our project uh, was we were trying to figure out how UV light affects the growth of bacteria. Um, so our experiment uh, was basically that we covered one half of a petri dish uh, with tin foil and then uh, the other half we treated with UV light for different amounts of time. Um, and then we tried to grow bacteria in the petri dish and as you can see uh, the bacteria only grew in the side that was not treated with UV light. Um, and by the time you get up to 15 seconds, it's almost completely eradicated. Uh, so bacteria, uh, the UV light is obviously a very great bacterial sanitizer. Uh, and the way that it does this is it causes mutations uh, in the bacteria cell's DNA uh, that accumulate and then kill the cell. Uh, so we didn't use this bacteria for the experiment, uh, but we swabbed a cell phone and this is the bacteria that's living on your cell phone. It's, it's pretty disgusting. Um, Right, so when we put the petri dish under the UV light for like five seconds, the bacteria was partially eliminated and the same for 15 seconds, it was almost eliminated. But when we put it under for 30 um, seconds to five minutes, it was almost completely eliminated by that time. So to take it one step further, further we decided to compare the effects of UV light versus Clorox wipes. And so we, this is, we swapped a toilet seat, so this is the control from the toilet seat. Then we um, wiped it down with Clorox wipes, and this is what happened after the Clorox wipes. There's still a little bit of bacteria, as you can see. And then right here, we complete. it was completely eliminated by the UV light in only 15 seconds. So in conclusion, Clorox works better than um, UV light. I um, mean, UV light works better than Clorox. Um, so there are a lot of op applications we can use in like everyday life. Um, for example, we have a toothbrush cleaner that um, cleans the you put the toothbrush in there and it cleans it with UV lights. There's also things such as cell phone cleaners and um, air purification. Um, so they would be definitely helpful to help clean more, better than Clorox. So. I'm now going to have to wrap it up, so I will do quickly. I know everybody's tired, but a couple things um, that I think are really important. Is I'm not sure if all of the parents realize that the projects we're judged by our high school juniors and seniors, AP students. So that is something that has grown over time. 
and it's extremely, I guess very proud feeling. They were our first group who uh, experienced the exhibition four years ago. So for them to come back and then be judges, it was an, a really exciting thing to transition for them. I'm Barry Connell, I'm an 8th grade science teacher at North Andover Middle School and I, I can't tell you how inspiring it is to see what these kids do given an opportunity to select the topic and pursue the things that they're most interested in. It's been a great, great science fair and we can't wait to do it again next year. My name is Kathleen Tarras and I am a science teacher at North Andover Middle School. I got into science about 14 years ago, um, came, coming from the business world and changing careers because I read a magazine saying what's happening to science in, in America. My father was a science teacher in Linfield for over 35 years and growing up I loved science. He brought me to the science fairs that he ran every year at Linfield Middle School. And when I changed careers, what I thought was, you know what, I'm going to follow in his footsteps. I am going to bring a science fair to a school system because so many school systems do not do science fairs anymore. They say, hey, what's this, just another battery, um, a lemon, lemon battery powered cell phone? Well, it goes a lot deeper than that. In fact, our students truly learn from the projects that they pick. They pick something they're interested in. They take them to a deeper and higher level. Hi, I'm CJ Jordan. I'm a eighth grade science teacher. I'm here live at the North Andover Science Fair. And it's just wrapping up now. What we saw inside was three months of work from the students. These students took in this project. They've been working at their house this entire time without huge guidance from us. They took on these ideas. We did not give them to them. And uh, the end product is, is something really phenomenal. Um, this was actually a surprise for me because, I mean, I definitely had my hopes up for it, but when we did our project, like, we tried our best, but, I mean, I'm actually kind of surprised that we won. There were a lot of great projects out there, but I thought the wind tunnel that was over here, I thought that one would win because it looks really, really good. Hello, I'm Matt Palmisano, and this is Aiden Ham, and we did a project on the heat conductivity in different metals. Uh, what we did for our project is we took a blowtorch, and we heated up all of these four metals at the same time. And then we took an infrared laser, laser thermometer, and that uh, tracks the temperature of um, the points in the metals. And so we took all the temperatures, and we put them in graphs, and then we, that's how we calculated um, which metals are the most conductive to the least conductive. And that order for us came out to be aluminum, copper, steel, then zinc. So that's what we figured out by doing our scientific project. All right, so we did our poster and our project on magnetic levitation trains. Uh, magnetic levitation trains are uh, trains that float or levitate on top of magnets in order to travel with less friction than a mobile wheelchair. Um, we did some research on things like magnetic levitation magnetism as well as electromagnets. And what we did for our project was we built two tracks, one with magnets on it and one with wheels on it, uh, one with no magnets on it that the wheelchair would ride along in order to compare which ones will better uh, travel down the track. Alright. For some of our we had developed three possible solutions, one of which would be a styrofoam uh, train going down, being propelled by an electric fan and sail, and uh, being levitated by circle magnets. Another possible solution would be the same as the last one, but this time the wheel train track is being made out of cardboard and has cardboard guardrails to prevent deviations from the track. And for our final possible solution, we had decided to revamp the maglev track for a more wooden design with wooden guard whales as they were more efficient from de to keep the train from deviating from the track. And, for our and we also put it on an incline instead of an electric pan and sail. We chose the final one because it seemed like it was most efficient for the purposes of our experiment. Our prototypes are right here. They're um, our magnetic uh, levitation train and track uh, made out of wood. 
um, and our um, wheeled training track. Uh, this one's made out of cardboard and popsicle sticks. Uh, we tested these by um, setting them on an incline and whichever we timed them, so uh, the one that reached the bottom first obviously is faster. Uh, we have our results um, in a graph and a table. So as you can see from the results, that the magnet magnetic levitated train is faster by a matter of milliseconds. This may not seem like much, but on a larger scale that it is used in, it can be in a matter of hours, and it really makes a large difference. The main places that these maglev trains are used in are like eight places with high populations, such as China and Japan. Um, after doing all of this, we decided to do a bit more research into um, how magnets work and the um, cost efficiency of maglev trains. From our research, we found that um, each magnet emits a magnetic field, and this is mainly made up of the electrons, mainly made up of electrons that are inside of the atoms. Um, we also found out that there are two main types of magnets. One is a permanent magnet and one is a ferromagnet. A permanent magnet is um, like a refrigerator magnet and it has its own magnetic field. A ferromagnet is um, such as the fridge and it doesn't have its own magnetic field, but if you were, put, were to put a magnet onto it, it would stick. A ferromagnet has um, small domains, or all magnets have small domains. A ferromagnet's domains are scattered in all different directions. Each one of these domains has its own positive and negative pole, and so when they're all scattered, they can't eat, they, it does not emit its own um, magnetic field. But when you align them, such as using an electromagnet, they all have their own domain and are able to emit their own magnetic field. Okay, so uh, this is our backyard blast off. So basically, uh, I've always loved space travel, aviation, everything to that sort. And uh, I never had the experience nor price range to actually do it myself. So what I did is I was searching around online and there was a little match with a, which a tiny bit of tinfoil on it. And uh, it could fly. So I wanted to try it and I tweaked it a little bit. I wrapped the whole entire thing with tinfoil and I made little fins on the bottom. But there's no match in here right now because I'm not intending to burn the school down. And um, so we have those. Our original question was if five layers or one layer would work better. Um, I tested the one layer and my partner who's not currently here at the moment did five layers. Um, the one layer worked, was really a 50-50 chance whether it would work well or not. So it would either crash and burn or it would fly incredibly well and um, just sort through the skies around 25 to 60 feet. And then the five layers, it also worked very well. There was a lot more room for um, completion but it would um, weigh down a lot and it would falter its flight time by, because of the drag, which is a pulling force during flight, and it would drop the rocket a lot quicker, giving it less flight time. And that's just about the gist of it of our backyard blast off. All right, for my project, I was studying the Magnus effect, and to show the effects of the Magnus effect, I built a homemade wind tunnel. And so how it works is I blow fog and wind through this, and I spin the ball. And then supposedly it will show me the effects of the wind tunnel by showing the wake of air behind the ball shifting to demonstrate the curve of the ball. And unfortunately it did not work when I did it, but it has been proven multiple times that it would work in actual wind tunnels that people have built. So overall we were able to break glass using sound. It has everything to do with the vibrations because sound is vibration. So oscillation is the movement back and forth and the glass is oscillating back and forth and it was actually bending because the glass is stiff and it's pure crystal so it was going back and forth and eventually as the sound got stronger it broke um, do you want to so um, we hypothesized that the glass could break with the correct natural frequency and then we could slow down the process so we were able to like slow down the process of breaking it by using damping materials such as elastics and water. Those materials absorb the vibrations and it doesn't allow the glass to break. Do you want to explain the speaker and how it works? 
So to break the glass, we used a speaker. Oh, that's interesting. A speaker and an amplifier. And how a speaker works is there's two magnets facing next to each other. And one of them is an electromagnetic magnet, and the other one is just a magnet. And the one that's just a magnet is st still in place. And the one that's electromagnetic picks up currents and moves around like this, which causes the particles to bounce back and forth in between each other, which vibrates the particles in front of it and goes out through the horn to break the glass. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so our project is about turning trash that we have in our everyday homes into methane gas that we can use to power cars. Uh, food is a big contributor to landfill waste. Up to 40% of food produced in the United States each year is trash and put in landfill. Uh, trash gives off fewer carbon gases, which not only helps our environment, but also helps with pollution. Uh, we are recycling organic waste and turning it into methane gas. We decided we wanted to test bananas and vegetables for our leftovers for this project because we wanted to test the difference between softer and harder textured food. So what we did for this project is we washed and dried out, um, we washed and cleaned our soda bottles, nine soda bottles, and then we labeled them three cow manure, three cow manure and banana, and three cow manure and vegetables. And um, then we measured 20 grams of cow manure for each of the nine soda bottles. And then we measured 20 grams of banana or vegetables and put those into the soda bottles. Next, we filled the soda bottles with distilled water. And after all that, we put a balloon over them and, made sh and secured them on with masking tape. After the whole procedure was over, we put them into a warm area where they wouldn't be shaken. And um, by doing this experiment, we can help the environment in more than just one way. So our project is about deflate. Um, during the AFC Championship game, when the balls were accused as being deflated, so we decided to test that using the ideal uh, law of gas. Uh, to test, we put the football in ice water, a fridge, outside, and in the snow. And uh, we put, filled it up to a certain PSI and then took it out after a, a certain amount of time. Yeah, and... Uh, um, our ice water had the biggest PSI difference, which was four. And the biggest PSI difference that the rest found during halftime at the game was 2.15 PSI, so this proved that the climate could have actually had the um, effect that they found on the balls during the game. And our hypothesis was correct, which was that when we moved the ball from room temperature into a colder temperature, that the ball's air pressure and PSI would drop. Okay, so we wanted to make natural water filters for people in other countries like Africa so they could have less, so less disease and so we made purified water and see if we pour this water into this purifier and out comes clear water and uh, the judges that judged us, they drank the water and they said it tasted like this tap water and you can see the difference here. And then we made another filter over here, but that one didn't work as well because of the, because of, there was no um, charcoal and cotton and the grass, so it didn't work out as well. And then over here you can see the difference in the filter. And if you want to tell you that one, that's okay. Do you want to explain the kind of photos? Oh yeah. So during our experiment, we took a lot of photos. So this is the first time that we used this, and we just started with milk water. Here is it in process of it, the process, and here's just an overview of the clean water that we came, that came out, which is this right here. Um, and this is a mini prototype of the clay pot one because we wanted to show people the different layers in it, and we didn't want to waste it on the prototype and we didn't know what we were doing with it. Here's the, that clay pot in process working, and here's an overview of it when the water is in it, and it's in, in the middle of it. So all of our filters, we made it a cheap, inexpensive cost, and the 
all made out of natural ingredients so people could get easy accessibility to these things. And in the end, we realized that this filter is better than that one because of the cotton and the grass. And you can drink this water and you won't get sick and it will be okay. And people in different countries, if they use this, they were less likely to die from this because over 42,000 people die weekly from diseases that have to do with contaminated water. So we thought that this would be a way to change that. And you said it's drinking? Yeah. Can I have a shot of you guys drinking it? Yeah. Do you want a cup too? experiment with those substances um, to see if they would go through, the magnets would still go through, and then we explained how MRIs work. So 
for my science fair project, I decided to figure out why Coke reacts with Mentos and what other types of chemicals it would react with. So our first step was to assure that the Coke and the Mentos would react the way we knew it would. When we performed our experiment, these are the results we got. The Mentos shot up about four feet high. This happens because on the surface of the Mentos, there are small pores, which when the Coke and the carbon dioxide in the Coke get into the pores, it causes a chemical reaction that allows it to fizz up. Uh, our project is on multitasking, and we see if a subject performs better while multitasking, and or if they perform better without. But our hypothesis is that they will perform better without multitasking. Um, we had the subjects play a memory game, and the first time they played the game with listening to the music, and the second time they played the game without listening to music. And 12 out of 20 people did better when they weren't multitasking, and 8 out of 20 people did worse when they were multitasking. So my project is called Balance in Aquatic Ecosystems, Factors Affecting Dissolved Oxygen Content in Water. So all aquatic ecosystems require dissolved oxygen in order to thrive and grow. And typically fish need about 4 to 5 parts per million of oxygen in the water. So when oxygen levels become too low, the body of water can become hypoxic, meaning it has 0.5 to 2 parts per million of oxygen, or even anoxic, where it has 0 to 0.5 parts per million of oxygen. And under those conditions, um, basically no life could possibly exist. So there are several things that affect dissolved oxygen levels. First of all, plant growth is really important. So during the daytime, plants perform photosynthesis, where they um, take in carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. And during the nighttime, they actually perform respiration where they take in oxygen and produce carbon dioxide. So photosynthesis and respiration don't balance out. Um, photosynthesis usually beats out respiration, so oxygen does rise overall. Also, plant decay. Plant decay takes away oxygen. Um, also, yeah. Okay. So plant decay also takes away oxygen from the water. Um, also nutrients added such as fertilizer uh, takes away oxygen from the water. So my question was how much do different combinations of plants, nutrients, plant decay, and sunlight affect levels of dissolved oxygen in water? So um, I hypothesized that um, plants would add a lot of oxygen during the daytime and take away some during the nighttime and that nutrients in decaying plants would also take away a lot of oxygen. But when plants were present with the nutrients in decaying plants, oxygen wouldn't drop as rapidly. So what I did was I made up nine different containers. Um, so I had my control, so just water. I had um, a container with 0.3 grams of um, nutrients, so basically like fertilizer which is sodium nitrate and sodium phosphate. And then I had one um, with 0.3 grams of decaying banana peel, um, one with plants, one with plants, uh, but they were covered, they were in the dark. So rather than photosynthesis, they would perform respiration. Um, then I had one container that had a uh, plant and nutrients, one with a plant nutrient and nutrients, which was covered, so again, respiration. I had one with a plant and three grams of decaying banana peel. Then I had, finally I had one, um, the plant, three grams of decaying banana peel, and it was also covered. So again, respiration. So what I did was I measured the oxygen levels with this meter. And um, these are my results right here. So this is my control, the green line. It stayed the same pretty much throughout the experiment. Um, this is a container that had plants in it. So during the daytime, um, oxygen rose, and during the nighttime, um, oxygen decreased due to respiration. So I took uh, a daytime and a nighttime measurement for five days for each of these. Uh, and then the container with the plant uh, that was covered, the plant was constantly performing respiration, so oxygen dropped the whole way. Uh, right here, this is the container with just nutrients, this green line. So oxygen just dropped steadily. 
Uh, right here, this orange line is the one uh, with nutrients and plants. So oxygen dropped, but after the nutrients had been broken down, the plant actually used the nutrients to build back up and it started producing oxygen again. And this red line right here, um, this is the plant and nutrients that were covered. So after the, the plant was performing respiration and as the nutrients were breaking down, a lot of oxygen was taken away and oxygen just stayed very low. A similar thing happened with the decaying plants, but oxygen levels dropped even more dramatically. And you can also see here that the plants started coming back. So um, overall, I saw that uh, with decaying plants, oxygen dropped um, fastest. And also the container that had just the plant in it stayed the clearest throughout the course of the experiment. And also, when plants were covered, oxygen dropped really quickly since they were constantly performing respiration. Um, so there are several things that we can do to prevent dangerously low oxygen levels because when oxygen levels are so low, it's very dangerous to fish. Fish usually um, can't survive for more than a few hours if oxygen is very low. So some things that we can do, um, limiting fertilizer use. Um, when fertilizer um, enters bodies of water, a lot of oxygen is taken away as it breaks down. Also, um, cleaning up after pets is very important because pet waste also takes a lot of oxygen out of the water as it breaks down. And also creating rain gardens. So basically rain gardens are small gardens at the edge of properties um, which filter out nutrients from the water so that when the water reaches um, the lake or pond, it'll be clean. So I also did some additional research on what this would look like um, in a real lake or pond. So eutrophication, it's a process um, which is caused by the increase of nutrients in a body of water. So what happens is when the nutrients enter the body of water, <laughs> algae blooms really quickly and the pond becomes overgrown and as the algae dies, a lot of oxygen is taken away. And a lot of the time, the pond or lake can become a dead zone. So fish would absolutely not survive there. So um, this is the difference between a healthy lake and a dead or eutrophic lake. Right here, you can see that there's clearly a lot of algae. So we've seen this in Lake Erie. Lake Erie has been known for this. Um, and. Lake Erie has been kind of, uh, well, in 1960, Lake Erie was at its worst. And in 1970, Lake Erie was brought back. Um, but since then, algae has come back. And Lake Erie is still trying to recover. And we can also see examples of this in our own town at Stevens Pond. Several summers ago, um, there were large blue-green algae blooms and this prevented residents from going swimming and fishing due to the shortage of fish. So again, there are many things that we can do to prevent low oxygen levels and eutrophication, which can lead to dead zones. And um, by taking these measures, we can ensure that our ponds and lakes stay healthy and thriving.